Hi, I'm Cody. I'm Brent. And we're the Hugo Knots, here to break down for you the best science fiction novels of all time. Today's book that we're going to talk about is A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. This book won the Hugo in 1961. The book comes in at 368 pages, 11 hours, if you're listening to the audio book, so it's nice and tight. Um, and it's set in a world that's been basically totally destroyed by nuclear war. And in the immediate aftermath, the survivors sort of blamed blamed science. And, and so they uh, waged a pogrom against scientific knowledge and destroyed you know, all books. They were killing everybody who was intellectual on Earth and knew anything. And over the course of generations, basically all knowledge was lost, except for a small monastery in the, in the American West, uh, inhabited by a bunch of wry, intelligent, and practical monks, um, where they're basically preserving and transcribing books and, and uh, information. Um, the novel takes place in three parts, uh, each separated by about 500 years, as generation after generation of these monks hand the surviving books and, and collected knowledge of humanity down through the years. It, that's, uh, that's pretty succinct. Yeah. That'd so what good. did you what did you think? Um, should people read it? What's your what's your what's your score? Four to five is what I give Canticle for Leibowitz. I enjoyed it. I agree. I think it's a really, really great book. Um, we'll talk about there's a couple of things that hold it back a little bit. But by and large, for the vast majority of the time, I was so entertained and I uh, thought it was really smart and fun and funny. Um, so anyway, yeah, I agree. Four out of five. Totally. Absolutely. And we both have uh, pockets on our shirts, so we know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> first of all, let's get into, let's get into some stuff. I would like to open, uh, with, uh, what, what is a canticle? Yeah. I great didn't know. Question. Yeah. I also didn't know. And, uh, the book also doesn't tell you, you just got to look it up, but it turns out that either, neither of us is Catholic, obviously Catholics would probably know this. Um, but it's a, it's like a religious Catholic religious song, basically. Uh, it's, it seems like it's a cross between like a song and a poem. Um, this book is not a poem. It's prose. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, good, good excuse to learn a new word. Um, yeah, it's specific, more specifically a, a like hymn or song poem for a saint. Oh, I see. Okay, so can okay that makes sense. Why? Okay, so Leibowitz, Saint Leibowitz, is right. who this monastery is named after. He's the first. Uh, Right after the nuclear war, he was the one who sort of started this order and started hoarding books. And so they they sainted him in the aftermath of the war for for starting this monastery and preserving the knowledge. So that makes sense. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, who are so, I mean, who are some of the monks in that? Let's get into it. Who are some of the monks in this book? Who are some of the people? We're gonna yeah, see. for sure. My, my favorite two are the, the 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 main character of the first part, uh, who's named Brother Francis. He's like a low level uh, monk in the order. Um, and then the person he's interacting with the most with is Abbot Arcos, who is the, the head of, uh, the order in, in that first time period, which is, um, the, the dark, dark ages basically. Um, and they spend all their time rewriting these books and copying them to, so, you know, so they don't fall apart given the, the long time span here. And, uh, brother Francis is so well-intentioned and sweet and so dumb. Uh, and Abbot Arcos is this like very just like he's super sharp. He knows he's like very self. Uh, uh, um, he doesn't take himself too seriously either. Like he knows all of them basically are so dumb. Like they're writing all this information down and none of them has any idea what any of this stuff is. But he right, really the- knows it's important to preserve it. Um, but he just doesn't take the whole thing too seriously and um, really he's kind of manipulative, honestly, but in such a funny, interesting way. Um, so I just love the way those two play off each other. And brother Francis is like always getting put on like, you know, latrine duty basically. Um, anyway, and yeah, the, they're just a and, great pair. Or he's the most, uh, devout trainee basically, um, at the, you know, through that whole first section. And he's the one who finds the proof that Leibowitz existed and finds, you know, other things. I won't spoil it, but, uh, and and it takes him whatever five, ten, fifteen years to become a uh, monk to be, you know, brought through monk's training. Where it's usually just one year, and it, the abbot just keeps not letting him yeah, do well, it. Abbot Arcos <laughs> is also a savvy political operator and knows like this guy who discovered Saint Leibowitz's manuscripts. Like we better keep him down so he doesn't come for me. Abbot Arcos is like not the nicest guy, 
Um, right. But right. <laughs> yeah, so they're great. Okay, so what they're about good. what about in part two? What do you think of the characters? The characters there. So I will say, like in general, what the characters mirror is kind of religion, spirituality, what we don't know versus knowledge and progress, right? And the characters in each part of the book play off of each other, representing one side or the other. Um, so in, in section two, 500 years in the future, we're in kind of a medieval setting. Um, I think of it as like a Eurocentric medieval setting. And you've got Thon Taddeus, who's the secular scientist who's discovered electricity and some other small things. Uh, but he they, hadn't actually made electricity work. But he hadn't, he, right. He, like he just had theorized some ideas. about it. Yeah. Exactly. And then and then Brother Kornhauer, who's at the Abbey, who has made it work in this hilarious con- giant contraption. Um, and the two the two meet um, and and Thon Taddeus finds out all the books they're sitting on and looks through them and realizes, you know, I've spent my whole life learning figuring this stuff out like basic math and stuff that didn't exist in the world to them um because it was all lost other than in these books he he's he spends his life figuring this stuff out when he could have just read it immediately yeah and he's so judgmental of these monks he like thinks they're such dimwits because they had all this knowledge and they didn't like come to his conclusions but then brother kornhauser like really puts him in his place because brother kornhauser is like oh you've been theorizing about stuff look i actually like made electricity and here's a light and so it's like a really interesting interplay. And there's also a lot of like science versus religion stuff there, which I think is a really interesting sort of foil for like, you know, 16th, 17th century Europe. It's like big conflict between the two, but played out in a much more funny and uh, less less uh, murdery way. And also um, Kornhauer is kind of unaware of what he's done, right? He's just so happy to show it to Thon Taddeus and to meet yeah, he's Thon not Taddeus. Being, yeah, he's not being competitive or a dick about it at all. And that makes even Thon Taddeus like kind of matter because Kornhauer's not even trying to lord it over him. He's just so stoked. Yeah. Um, he's like, oh, look at this cool thing I made. And Thon Taddeus is like, man, I'm trying to be a genius and you're upstaging me and you don't even, you don't even care. And my life's um, work is just art has already been written. We just, I just didn't know it was written down somewhere else. I had just, yeah. 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 So they're great foils for that, you know, that basic theme, knowledge, religion, spirituality, like where they clash, what the cyclical natures are. Um, but then at, we have section three as well, which is the final section, little different. Um, Cause you got Abbot Zerchi, but it's basically just first world leaders. Yeah, so Abbot Zerchi is the leader of the monastery in like the postmodern era, where te- their technology has like mostly exceeded ours. They have spa- you know interstellar spaceships and uh, some really interesting genetic technology. Um, no spoilers, but things are not good in the future world of of Campbell for Leibowitz. And so Abbot Zerchi has to navigate these really sort of difficult problems. And but while he's like maintaining his his Catholic morality and that's sort of butting up against some some really harsh realities of that modern world. Um, I won't say too much about that. He's an interesting character. Um, he's definitely the strongest point of that third that third part, which is I think the the the, le- the least good part of the book. But um, but he's still he's he's really a likable, interesting character and, and really presents some interesting moral choices and and what sort of morality you know, how the religion and morality interfaces with like sort of futuristic technology, I think in a pretty interesting um, way. And, and the, the book's written in 1961. It's the classic, um, future technology where there's like not some technologies that we've had for 20 years that are much part of the world, but then there's some stuff that we haven't quite figured out yet, you know, like genetic gene splicing and, and, Versus, uh, you know, we don't have gene splicing, but we do have the internet and phones. They don't have that yet. They're still whatever. Um, yeah, for sure. The, this transitions to the next thing I was going to talk about well, which is um, this book is oddly, you know, what is a sci-fi book? What makes a book science fiction? Because there's such a broad range. And at first glance, this book doesn't really feel like science fiction necessarily. Yeah, I think that it meets the definition because it's clearly set in the future. Um, but yeah, I hear you that it's not a, you know, uh, some you know futuristic technology that fundamentally changes like the way human lives work is like not one of the driving factors of the book. But it is set in the future. 
And I think the thing that I actually think is most important about science fiction is it lets us sort of confront our problems in a, in a, in sort of a fresh way um, and look at them through by, by like tilting, you know, t- tilting the way that problem appears so people can come at it with fresh eyes. And I think this book definitely does that. Um, it's very much about the dangers of nuclear war. You know, it really, it feels like it's really uh, uh, a good thing to, to understand for people from our era. And it's really like emblematic of the, the 60s. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm going to call it sci-fi, but I hear, I hear what you're Yeah, I and I, you're I, think, sure. I think ultimately what's interesting about it is that it's more like epistemological, really just like the, the search for uh, the study of knowledge itself. Um, it's more about that than like a specific technology's relationship with humanity, like you said. And it, it explores basically a future where we just retread the exact same past from the last thousand years in this new thousand years. We lose <laughs> all of our knowledge. We still, uh, we, we end there's an apocalypse. We don't necessarily. Yeah. Instead of the, instead of the fall of the Roman empire, we have a nuclear pop. Apoc- exactly. So we still have all, yeah. but we have all <laughs> the documents and all the knowledge preserved by these monks, but no one really looks at it. And so we go through the same thousand years again and end up right smack dab where we were. Yeah, for sure. So what, uh, what do you think makes this book so funny? I think what, what makes it so funny is that, there's a lot of dramatic irony in it, right? We flex, we get to see um, stuff that we know and we know the purpose of, and then people positing on what that purpose is. Like you've got uh, the the manuscript in the first section of the book that Brother Francis finds and then later illuminates, you know, with gold leaf and everything is just a blueprint. It's called um, Transistorized Control System for Unit 6B. And they, you know, he has conversations about what, what is it? What is the thing? It's like, it's transistorized control unit for unit 6B. What, like, what more do you need to know? Like, obviously yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. But it, it's just exposing this fact to like, none of these guys have any idea what's going on. And frankly, St. Leibowitz, who they honor, like he did a great thing by starting this monastery, but like, it seems like he was just like a very not important, like electrical engineer. Like he was not a genius. It's not like he was doing great science, um, but they all, he's like this great hero in the future. Right. And they all like literally worship Just happens him. to be um, who survived. There's. Yeah. And he was making like minor parts for electronic. Right. Devices. Yeah. <laughs> and all the parts are in there. Anyways, I'll, you know, let people read the book, I suppose. Um, the, that then you've got in section two, the giant, electrical apparatus that takes over the entire library bottom um, that Brother Kornhauer puts together. And it's got like literal, you know, you've got monks who need to like work bellows and pull things to create this electrical energy that ultimately is this Rube Goldberg machine that makes like a single light bulb turn on. Um, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's funny. This uh, like the yeah, output for versus sure. the size. Um, for sure. So what about... Um what about, so there's a lot, a lot of, you know, fiction and, and, you know, TV shows and everything that are set sort of in like post-nuclear war apocalypses. How would you rate this one? Do you like it? Does the setting feel fresh and interesting, even though that's like such a trope? It's interesting because it's not novel, right? It's just like the middle ages and other time periods happening in this, you know, Southern and, Southern middle and Southern Western United States. Um, what, what did yeah. you think about it? It felt real and it felt like the right vehicle to like take us through these ideas. And at no point did I feel like, like, Oh, I've read this book before, you know, which is the danger of kind of, you know, setting, setting your book in a place like that, I think. So I think that did a good job. And frankly, also let's to be fair to Walter Miller. Uh, I think it was one of the first books that did that. So I think he actually, the, the, I think a, a really part of the reason it feels so familiar is so many people who came after him used his setting because it's a great, great setting. Obviously too, he used this world as an example of like what we're trying to avoid, which is the core theme of the book, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people like in our generation, frankly, have like forgotten how scary nuclear weapons are. You know, we didn't grow up with like duck and cover drills in school and, you know, hearing about the Cuban Missile Crisis and feeling like, you know, that the world is really close to nuclear decimation. Um, but the fact is, the world is really close to nuclear decimation. You know, between us and Russia, there's enough missiles to, like, absolutely kill, like, 99% of the world population. 
Uh, India and Pakistan are building more missiles all the time, and they're right next to each other. China is building a bunch of uh, nuclear silos in their their western desert right now. And um, you know, nuclear there's there's not a lot of things. There's a, there's a you know people don't feel good about the future right now, um, but I think we mostly feel you know we're, we're nervous about the future for things that I think mostly will definitely like not end human civilization and we're but we like feel really bad about those problems. One of those things that really could end human civilization is nuclear war, and, and we don't and like, we don't we don't talk about it or worry about it. Yeah, like just yeah. like that, and there's nothing any of us can do. Like if those missiles get launched, like we're both definitely gonna die in like. 90 minutes. There's absolutely no way to, I don't know. I'm in, um, I'm in the zone. I'm in Denver. So get Denver in Canticle. Denver is a new kingdom. So I don't know. Let's see. See, you don't think they're going to, the Russians are going to nuke like the, the, the 30th largest city. No, I'll be the king of Denver. Don't worry. Um, (laughs) (laughs) medieval. Um, I think I, I do. So yeah. So the other, the other thing this book talks about, um, a lot and I, I thought was really interesting was it really uh, helps you think about religion in a pretty new way. Um, how did you, how did you feel about that piece? How did you feel sort of exploring Catholicism through this, this interesting lens? I thought the, I thought what was most interesting to me about the, the whole argument, you see this again, a lot in sci-fi it's explored in a much different way here because it's directly through Catholicism and a historical Catholicism, right? You know, monks originally were keepers of knowledge and Jesuit priests were in the Middle Ages um, the the beginners of logic, which to many now seems uh, counterintuitive, right? To make um, logic and argue, logic against or scientific logic against religion, they seem to butt heads, but the, the Catholic Church kind of started that. Um, and it is interesting in Canticle to see the cyclical nature of knowledge versus, uh, religion, like I've said before, but to describe it better, um, you, you see that humanity needs this, at least some sort of spirituality or awareness, you know, that we're not everything about the universe, um, as well as we need science and progress but it's impossible to see where there's a line. You know, it's like, wh- where does where is progress, where does progress need to stop for us not to kill ourselves, but also we want to get better and, and, and also cut that kind of inevitability of both, right? That, that we as beings need to seek more and more and more um, and, and know more uh, through science, but also uh, how important it is to hold on to the spirituality and, and, uh, let our egos go, uh, before we destroy yeah, ourselves. Sure. Yeah. And I think that the other thing that really struck me with it is it, it, it also felt like a really interesting sort of look at how, uh, sort of like power corrupts and like in, in some ways, you know, corrupted some of those original ideals of the, of the, the Catholic faith. Um, part two is very much about this conflict sort of between like the Pope and these new Kings who are rising up. And as a result, the Pope is sort of becoming anti-science and it, it seems to be mostly like a resistance to change. And I think that's a really, you know, we see it all the time throughout human history, you know, people in power tend to really resist change. And I think that leads to a lot of this. Um, I, I just think it's a really, you know, a smart point. And it was really interesting to see sort of that medieval conflict between the Pope and Kings sort of played out and in this interesting alternative way. And with this twist of like, how was the church thinking about, uh, uh, their, you know, their relation to, to science and Le- the, these, this order of St. Leibowitz was a really interesting way to explore that. Cause they're totally focused on like preservation of knowledge, but they're still part of this like broader Catholic church that as the book goes on, that kind of changes. And it's, and it's knowledge um, for knowledge sake, right? The whole, that's kind of the whole yeah. point is that they're just preserving the knowledge. They're not trying to implement it necessarily. And some of them rebel against that idea because that's inevitably where knowledge seeking leads. Um, but I think also to your point about power, wanting to keep a status quo is true of everything in progress and knowledge and science other than military might and weaponry, right? Is the one area of progress that someone who's in power wants to move past the status quo to have more power. Um, versus that's right, that's just right, technology yeah. and knowledge for for all, um, they want to have the best 
military weapon. And that's, and that's, right. and that's what, what those kings, to... uh, you know, the kings and the world leaders are all so focused. They're, yeah, they're, they don't really care about science. They're all focused on right. weapons. And, you know, of course, that has uh, that's how that's how this whole book right. started with the nuclear war at the beginning. So, so yeah. it's it, it's interesting too to talk about Walter Miller Jr. a little bit um, because this is the only book he wrote. Uh, and uh, there's one, it, there's a sequel that was posthumously published in 1997, but, uh, it's the only book he published, wrote and published in his lifetime. Um, and why, you know, what do we see of him in the canical? So first of all, he actually, the, the reason this book is sort of has such an interesting narrative structure is it actually originally published as three sort of long short stories or novellas, and then they got pushed together into this novel. And I think they work really well as a novel. But you can see, you know, that origin very much makes sense as you're reading it. Um, but yeah, his life, he was a um, he was an engineer and then um, fought in World War II and was was a, a tail gunner in a, in a bomber. Um, he was involved in a bombing raid in Italy that destroyed a monastery. Um, the Monte Cassino bombing. Yeah. Yeah. Really good name. Um, and so, yeah, I think you can very much see, and, and then of course, this book is so much a product of like the late fifties when people were so, were, you know, nuclear weapons were, were new. They had just been used, you know, 10 or 15 years before in Hiroshima and we had seen what they can do it was so fresh in people's minds and the, you know, mutually assured destruction was just ramping up and, and getting scarier and scarier and scarier. And so um, it was very much a, a product of, of both his background and I think the, the times it was written in and. Um, I think that's part of what makes it such an interesting, interesting book that stands the test of time. Cause it really, it helps us think about the future and these really fundamental human problems, but also like, it's a really cool, interesting way to think about, you know, what were people worried about in 1959, 1960, 1961? Yeah, exactly. And a weird and a super weird setting to explore what people were worried about at that time yeah. in. So, you know, overall, uh, I, gave this book a four. I think I gave it a four because I thought it was a refreshing sci- take on science fiction, basically to, to re-explore. It's like, what what if there was an apocalypse and we just had to redo the last thousand years? And what could that turn out like? And what would that look like if we already, and, and from an audience perspective, you are, that the irony is that you know all these things that they're trying to discover already because they've already happened to us. Instead of positing about a new, technology or something like that. thought it was a wonderful um, expression of spirituality versus um, knowledge seeking and the inevitability and cyclical nature of both. For sure. Yeah, I liked all that stuff too. Yeah, I also gave it a four, mostly just because the third part is definitely not as good. The things that happen in it are good and make sense. And really the narrative like feels like a complete whole. But there's a bunch of things that happen in the third section that like don't make very much sense. And and um, don't feel as cohesive. It's not the most important things happening in that section, but it's definitely, definitely feel, uh, feels not as good. So, um, that's, I think the only thing that's, that's holding me back from giving it a five, but I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I love that it's short, you know, there's sometimes that it's, you know, authors can get crazy and get, get way too long with things. There's just, there's a lot here and it doesn't take a long time to get there. So I thought it was really, I agree. I think, you know, Um, it's a fun place to, to be and you're there for the the ideas and some of the humor of the smaller interactions. So let's do this. One of my favorite favorite sections of of the the, the podcast is when we talk about like if you liked this book, um, you know what else should you read? Or you know maybe if you like one of the books on this list, you know you'll like Canical. So um, after reading Canical, Cody, what what books came to mind? Um, the first book that I thought of was Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. Um, you know the Sherlock Holmesian. Uh, Jesuit priest going to solve a, a murder mystery. Uh, it has a lot of the same uh, themes um, of knowledge and religion um, inherent, and it's also about monks. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the first one I picked was The Forever War by Joe Haldeman, which was written just a few years later, and it's another sort of anti-war sci-fi novel. Um, and... Uh, so I think those, uh, I, I really, I love both the books and I think they have a lot in common. And I think Joe Haldeman and Walter uh, Miller Jr. actually knew each other um, and I think sort of connected over their shared hatred of uh, uh, Walter, um, Joe Haldeman, who wrote Forever War, fought in, in Vietnam and then wrote this sort of anti-Vietnam book. Walter Miller had this really scarring experience in World War II. And so I think there's there's a lot in common between them and a lot in common between between those two really classic sci-fi books. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, my, my other 
one. Actually, you should you should do yours first. We have two more. Okay. Yeah, I can do. I'll do um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Um, there's not a lot of sci-fi, frankly, that's like really funny. Um, but Hitchhiker's Guide, of course, is the um, gold standard. Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, it, it's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide is you know really just a, it's about the comedy. There's not so many you know sort of themes and big ideas in there, but damn, it is so fun to read. Um, and I just I really love that lighthearted take on on uh, you know on on science fiction. So I definitely think if you like Canical, you like you like Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in that vein, a couple Hein lines. We chose a couple just because a lot of Hein line is like this. But you got a Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, Obviously, a uh, pretty direct um, spirituality versus progress, knowledge, science, the world leaders and society. Um, and uh, it also has some wry humor um, as well as Double Star, which is a little bit less about the, f- the, the connected thematically, but has that really dry sense of humor. Um, present throughout yeah the main character in double star just so much reminds me of like a fusion of brother brother francis and uh arcos and yeah. Abbott arcos mm-hmm. from part one it's just like the two of them smashed together in one character and he's so fun to spend time with for that book so so yeah yeah so four out of five amalgamated score for a canicle for Leibowitz. it was definitely an enjoyable read um we both we both liked it a lot and those are some other books you can try out or you might like canicle if you liked those Uh, But yeah, anything else, Brent? No, that's it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.